create if money wasn't an issue? And I think in the same vein, what would you design without ever requiring physical material? What if your entire creative process was in, happened in a space where nothing is limited by cost or availability? Now, I think it's easy for creatives to kind of cap ourselves with mental limitations. And I often feel like if a task is so overwhelmingly large or complex, it's easy to start kind of comforting ourselves with reasons as to why they can't be completed. I think things like lack of money, lack of resources, lack of time are all perfectly reasonable. But I also think it's very funny how much could be created and done with a little bit of delusion and a free tool like Blender. So, my name is Jessica Wiseman, I'm 23 years old, and I started off as a realism painter, now a 3D animator and designer. I took the unconventional approach back in 2019 to try and make a creative career work uh, instead of attending university. But before then, for a bit of context, I spent the best part of my early childhood constantly drawing and fell deeply in love with the challenge of realism in all mediums later into my teens. And so, out of a love for learning, I got hooked to 3D when I was 14 and took it a lot more seriously at 18, when my paintings would take too long for the projects and ideas that I wanted to create. And so, not only does 3D allow for a faster outflow of ideas, but platforms like Blender allow for, that's constantly updating, kind of scratch that learning itch, because learning almost felt endless. And so, ultimately, over the last four years or so, Blender has been kind of my sole right-hand man for generating ideas, product concepts, marketing for my brand, short film animations, and whatever brands and projects that I've been working on. And I realized very quickly how powerful a tool is that can bring ideas to visualization. And so, being able to have an idea, concept it, texture it, and build the model to a certain level of realism opened doors for manufacturing products, for explaining ideas in a more visual way to consumers, and for presenting a concept that was once an idea in a tangible form, where things like material, shape, and colors can all be changed to whatever you're liking. All while not having to spend anything on product sampling, for hiring studio spaces, or not needing even professional cameras, or not requiring even computers nowadays through the use of render farms and things like that. So, as soon as this became super apparent to me, I, it almost felt like I just regained a bulk load of time. Because think about every single one of those points. Sampling products alone can take months. Hiring models for photo shoots can take weeks for prep and money. And for a lot of people, those are the exact reasons that stop them from starting a company. And so, it's examples of some renders uh, that I've been sharing on my Instagram. And I think a great example of this is a project that I did with Artifacts and Nike as a competition which is a great example of how Blender can be used not only for the final product, but for the kind of manufacturing plan and, and bring in an, an idea that was once a sketch into a final form that can be rendered out and explained to people. So this project, for example, was a product design that I came up with of a shoelace attachment kind of spine that could be added to your shoe and can tr track GPS and pedometer data and that kind of thing. But I just found it incredibly cool how you could have an idea one day, and in the span of four days to like a week, you can kind of bring your idea to life in a more visual and tangible form. And so, after spending a few years in the music industry for concert graphics and for various brands, FigureGot was my own company that I started with my brother um, as a kind of a unique character IP, or similar lines to something like Sanrio, Minions, Pokemon, those kind of, kind of uh, characters and designs. So they're created from childhood drawings that I would draw with my brother when I was seven years old, and with the interest of digital collectibles back in 2021 and 2022, I really wanted to test what I could create if I put all my energy into one thing. And I, I loved a kind of a wide range of art styles, whether that was through um, kind of, yeah, these were the initial shapes, but there was also a, a wild range of art styles like illustration to fabric to comic book to 3D rendering, pixel art, and that kind of thing. And I just basically wanted an excuse to put all the things that I love learning into one kind of umbrella brand. Because I think for a long while, I thought it was kind of, um, the fact that I didn't have a quote-unquote style was kind of my issue, but um, yeah, it, I kind of wanted to funnel it into one, one brand. So it meant that unlike my previous, previous freelance work, I can get, incorporate all my strengths under one umbrella, meaning our startup costs were basically zero, because everything from the art side of things, including the animations, promotional posters, the digital collectibles, logos, website, and concept products were all created on my own. And even though I was working out from my bedroom, Blender enabled me to design, prototype, and even market our products all, all virtually. I could create concept-ready photo, real products, and use these renders to gather interest and, and build narratives throughout my short film animations online. And so there was no physical prototypes, no production delays, no expensive material costs, just endless creative possibilities which allowed me to showcase my vision in a more tangible way without ever having actually anything tangible. I think in a digital age where Blender allows for creativity uh, kind of beyond the constraint of what you can hold in your own hand. 
And so realism in general challenges our ability to see and replicate the world. I think the idea of taking something tangible, something that exists in the physical world, and translating it into another medium, whether it's through drawing, painting, or 3D rendering, is tricky because we've lived our whole life through sight and with sight. And so it's the same reason in various uh, movies, as soon as a CGI replaced character enters a scene, we instantly get that feeling of uncanny valley. And so, Humans have this innate ability to sense when something is off from what we traditionally know, or in unfamiliarity in patterns. And even though realism is seen kind of quote-unquote negatively, especially in the physical painting world, in my opinion, it allows you to kind of understand the complexities of light, depths, shapes, and forms of everything around us first, which you can then kind of use from our basic understanding of reality into more abstract art forms. And so, as we get into the heart of the presentation, I kind of wanted to walk through some of the methods and tricks that I learned along the way to improve and develop photorealism in Blender. So these are a few examples based on the project I mentioned called Figurgot, which is a character IP brand. And these are all kind of renders and ideas and concepts that, for instance, what would this character look like if it was put in an interior scene? How would the table look like? Um, and uh, those that follow my processes on Instagram, I always write about how textures and lighting are the biggest cheat codes to achieving realis realistic results. And so these, again, are, no are a few other examples of entirely 3D um, built uh, images. Nothing, I mean, I think a lot of people on Instagram assumed that this particular render was just kind of an image texture put onto a, a geometry kind of in, in 3D. And I'm going to explain later my process to texturing and how I kind of bring these materials to life through the use of also image textures, but a method that I kind of call texture stacking. And I think it's the same in portrait painting. No matter the cost of the paint you're using, it's not the tools and the shapes that, that dictate the outcome of the artwork. It's the lighting, the textures, textures and the techniques used to create skin, for, in, for instance. And I think the same goes in 3D. So I think at this point in the talk, a lot of people tend to think, like, my computer won't be able to do that, and I want to, I want to prove that it can. So in Blender, optimizing your scenes as best as possible and finding cheap co cheat codes to similar ways to achieve complex results only ever gets discovered when you have a bad PC. I think a lot of people here can relate, but like problem solving and finding smarter ways around things are transferable even when you do end up upgrading your computer. So those skills are kind of invaluable to getting faster and more efficient at creating realistic results. I think a great example of this, of this is like the team behind every, Everything Everywhere All at Once, where they're such a small team, but they also can create results just as crazy as the blockbuster movies we see on our screens in cinemas. And yeah, I think it's a great example of using a mixed media approach of texture stacking along with photo reference as a base texture. Because simply adding an image on top of a 3D object, in my opinion, isn't always enough to make it look realistic. And so I almost use these kind of base images uh, of image textures that you take in real life as kind of like diffuse and use layer masks over the top, which I'll explain in a bit. Uh, but all these designs that I've been showing up to, these, up to this point are all concept products and ideas for Figurgot. The brand itself is birthed out of the idea to put everything I'd learned into one company, uh, which I wanted to cover many areas, whether that be tech, animation, products and clothing, and education, all under one character IP. And so, with the, with the support of my short story animations online back in 2021 and 2022, involving a storyline of kind of like a, ro a lonely robot building figurines in a more kind of dystopian world, uh, every single person that owned our first drop of real life figurines also owned a unique digital version of that figurine. And so Figurgot's beginnings are built on digital ownership and a model that allows owners to engage and invest in the company by holding those individual tokens. And so obviously with the wider expansion of, of the company, the increase in value of those original tokens. And so for my brand, Blender was not just used for product designs, but it's also used for kind of the entire brand visual identity. Um, and for me, this was kind of the best excuse to put everything I had learned from freelance into one model, cater for multiple areas under one character IP, and build a strong community by constantly giving value to those that support it. And I wanted to build products and clothing because that allowed me to tap into illustration and that product design side of things. But equally, I wanted to create animations, stories, and work on 3D modeling. And fortunately, found a way to do all of this, as well as posting them online and being able to share my techniques of how I created them. And so to me, despite us being at the very early stages of this company, it's not just a figurine or a clothing company. To me, this is an umbrella company that allows for any idea, any design, any artwork to be built under one roof, all whilst being funded by the strong community of people that invested in us at the beginning and through the underlying digital tech that started us off. 
And so this is exactly where Blender plays a huge role. I think everything, like I was saying, up to now in these slides have all existed purely in the digital space only. And I've been able to, sh to share these designs, market them, and ultimately sell a real product purely based off those initial 3D models. Uh, with no expenses for sampling, no paying other people for marketing, or even having to hire cameras or professional photos to be taken. And I think it's all, it's all down, to be, down to the fact of being able to convey to an audience what you want to build. By designing and creating realistic mock-ups and concepts, you eliminate misinterpretation between sharing an idea and having someone listen to it. And instead, you're able to see, they're able to see with their own eyes what, for instance, a necklace would look like if it was designed by you, or what a jumper would look like, or a short film animation series, etc. And so with this being kind of the, the final figurine design that I could send to my manufacturer, uh, along with all the other images, it quite literally also eliminates error in the production side of point, you're not having to constantly spend money on sampling because they have a very kind of tangible objects and images that they can reference from. And so after the initial sale and funding of our company, at the beginning, I was pretty much free to create as much content as I could. Uh, this included things like, what would this character look like if I created movie-style posters for it? Uh, various other 3D and illustration-based posters. And of course, a lot of people know kind of the, the Punisher's Kinetic Rust 3D Challenge. Uh, so this was a, another great example of just kind of a hobby animation that I wanted to submit that was under that kind of character design. Uh, this included kind of three styles, uh, Blender's Grease Pencil for that middle section, uh, kind of a, uh, both cycles at the start the beginning, and cycles kind of finishing it off with that um, stop motion style. So, yeah, it was able to incorporate all three styles in, into, those, into that kind of short film tw uh, seven second clip. And I think uh, I also have a video on my Instagram and YouTube channel that goes over the creation of this animation. Uh, but I think it all just kind of encapsulates how much you can put into one thing if you kind of have enough passion and drive in order to, to pursue it. And so I think this is the stage of the talk where I want to go through actually how these designs and textures are built and how they get to the stage of realism where I'm happy to render it and kind of finalize it off. So texture stacking is a method that I kind of been been calling, um, and it's what I use in every single one of my uh, materials. It involves essentially adding a new element to the node tree, with each element adding invisible detail. So invisible detail are those like, tiny imperfections and subtleties that we're so used to seeing in everyday life that we kind of overlook them entirely. And in my opinion, those invisible details are what results in a material looking less CG and more realistic. And I think it's easy kind of to, to um, kind of understand how that process worked in that watch example, but not everything is as straightforward. For instance, this is a texture that includes kind of a lot of textures in, in one uh, 3D render. Um, and the actual node tree I like to show because it will start, makes people panic when they see a node tree like this, especially for something as simple as the egg. Um, which uh, all of this is done procedurally as well as creating my own masks. Huh? That's not to say I don't use image <laughs> textures, uh, as I'll be showing a bit later, uh, because I definitely do. But once I go through this kind of method on how I explain how uh, this tree kind of gets formed, uh, hopefully it'll come a lot more clearer. So the actual tree itself is broken down into the mask, the mix shaders, and the principal B BSDFs at the bottom. So if we kind of look at it in a more visual format, I start off with a base texture, and I add a mask connected to another texture, and I finish it off with geometry pointiness and that ambient occlusion. Now, the reason the mask uh, connected to the BSTF is kind of uh, highlighted in gray, because the next <coughs> slide will show you can basically keep stacking them on top of each other until you kind of get the, the result of the texture that you want. Uh, but for example, if I was creating something like a Game Boy uh, 3D, 3D render, I'd start the base texture would just be a very simple plastic texture. And then, for instance, the next stage up would be masking out maybe fingerprints or uh, scratches in the surface or a bit of discoloration and adding the BSDF and constantly stacking them on top of each other. I think this method is very similar to, for instance, if you were doing an oil painting and you kind of start off with that base layer. Uh, of the skin, and you constantly are kind of layering or stacking textures on top of one another. So in the egg example, at the top of the, proceed, the node tree, these are kind of showcasing what the masks are actually doing in the scene. So I'll start off with the egg as a very, the base texture being the white of the egg, and the next stage of those texture masks is masking out the next color that I want on top of the white. So in this case, it will be the yolk of the egg, so I'm masking out the area where the yolk will be. And the next stage of that mask is kind of adding discoloration and little blotches within the actual white of the egg. And it's constantly stacking these elements on top of one another until you get the actual final result. So 
Of course, this is kind of the textures that are happening at the bottom. So those are the masks, mixing them with the textures at the bottom. So um, yeah, as you can see, the, the yellow of the egg has been added, the little kind of eggshell and the other eggy kind of elements are added right at the end in order to create the final um, thing. So if I was to put this back into the graph that I was showing, yeah, you have the base texture, the very white of the egg being the first stage of this process. You're masking out the next stage of colors. So uh, having that kind of uh, masked out yolk, mixing that with the, with the texture shader, and constantly stacking them on top of one another until you get to this bit at the end, which I've called optional. Because in some uh, textures, for instance, for instance, food, you kind of don't need to create so, uh, geometry pointedness and ambient inclusion because they, I kind of like to use as the a section of the texture where the texture is almost kind of broken down and destroyed a little bit. I'll explain it in the next slide. So. Um, yeah, you can kind of see it more clearly in this, in this example, where the kind of bulk load of textures at the beginning is the base texture, and then I have my mask at the top with a mix shader and the principal BSDF, and it's constantly stacked on top of each other until it gets to the, to the final output. And so, again, this was kind of looking at it in a more visual format, the base texture being the first kind of layer of this hot chocolate, and then you're having kind of that milky mask at the top, which adds that on top, adding kind of the powder, add that on top, and it's constantly adding on top until you get to the final result. And I think now it's, it's good to explain kind of how geometry pointiness and uh, ambient inclusion is used kind of as that final deterioration right at the end. So for instance, with something like this, where the actual base texture itself could be kind of just a plain plastic, but those invisible details I was explaining earlier about how uh, things that you, you kind of overlook uh, in real life, for instance, kind of uh, slight peeled plastic around the edges of toys that are frequently used and slight discoloration around the most used limbs, for instance. Um, so in order to kind of create that, in this instance, I didn't texture mask a uh, bunch of masks on top of each other because the actual base texture itself just needed to be plastic. And then I used geometry pointiness and ambient inclusion to kind of destroy the material that I just created in order to make it kind of seem more realistic. Uh, so in this instance, again, you have the base texture being that plastic. Geometry pointiness in Blender is a, is a great node where you can, it kind of highlights the areas of the uh, 3D model that are the most sharp. Um, so it's great for things like destroying the edges or eroding kind of the edges of any 3D model. And then obviously mixing that in with what you want, the color that you want to appear under that mask. So then you get the final output um, on the right, which is kind of the combination of using geometry pointiness and BSDF to create that outcome. And then, I mean, a lot of people at this point could probably stop on the left and not even add ambient occlusion. But like I was mentioning about invisible details earlier, I think ambient occlusion and kind of getting that kind of grittiness around the limbs and the areas of a toy, for instance, that are most commonly used, kind of adds that little bit of realism. So this is using the same process um, as I was just describing. And so this is it in a more kind of uh, visual kind of way again. In this case, I've added a mask just to prove you can still add that mask if you want to add something like a little paint stripe of a different color on top of that base texture. And then just destroying that material um, with geometry pointiness and ambient occlusion. I think those two at the end are great for things like metals or plastics, and not, for, for instance, for the egg example, where you kind of don't need that destruction of the edges because it's a kind of a weirder material. Um, and so, yeah, this was a 3D render that I put on my Instagram that a lot of people were kind of confused on how this was textured. And this is a great example of using the same method that I just described, but instead of that base texture being a procedurally uh, built texture in Blender, I'm using just a photo reference, so an image texture, as that first stage as the base texture. And then I'm adding those te texture ma masks on top of that base image uh, until you get that final really realistic skin tone. Because in my opinion, kind of using a straight image texture and putting that straight on a, on a mesh isn't enough. So in this instance, uh, things like the base texture was the picture of my arm, but then on top of that, you, I was adding masking out pores, adding subsurface, and kind of doing that tree that I was describing a few slides ago, uh, but in skin, for instance. And so I think lighting also is a great example of how realism can be brought to life along with textures. Uh, I do think like, if someone was to ask me which one is more important, I'd tater more towards textures because, uh, for instance, in real life, the sun is a very ambient lighting. And what, every, what makes everything look real isn't necessarily the fact that the sun is creative with its lighting. It's the fact that textures and real life objects have kind of all these elements of reflectivity and um, yeah, just these things that I've, dis I've been describing that you can add through nodes in them in real life, detail, those kind of things. And so, for instance, um, the image on the left, 
is kind of the lighting setup being pretty much just a point lamp with a, a HDRI and kind of, yeah, adding planes on either side as a kind of light block like you would in photography in real life. And so, but for instance, this is also a model which the textures were the same in both. Um, this was obviously created using the same texture stacking method, starting off as an image, adding uh, layers of masks over the top until it gets like a realistic skin tone. But you can clearly see that the image on the right is far more blown out and less realistic compared to the image on the left where a more creative lighting is used. So, uh, yeah, it, lighting does play a humongous role, but I think if you were to use just kind, kind of a HDRI in any of your scenes, if you are able to build a texture and your textures to be kind of visceral and ta tangible enough, it doesn't really matter about the lighting as long as you have that world lighting uh, already kind of catering for your environment. And so, for instance, lighting also plays a huge role in the way kind of emotion and uh, colors are kind of formed. And so this, these are stills from my short film animation. Um, and also, everything that I do design, I always sketch out way before they ever get created, because I think it's important to also kind of have an understanding in your mind on what you want the outcome to look like much before you ever begin. And so, again, these are some other short film animations, uh, stills from various projects. But I also think it's also kind of Good to understand that not everything has to be perfectly created behind the scenes. I think this happens a lot in, in kind of photo shoots for various, uh, yeah, just photography in real life. You don't have to build the set other than what's shown in the camera. So, for instance, for a lot of my indoor scenes, I don't have all four walls around it to allow, allow, allow light in from certain angles. And like the robot on the left is kind of half neck up built just for the camera. And so, Every, by using these techniques over and over again, I, be, I kind of was able to build a collection of images and collection of renders and collection of any product designs or any inventions or anything under this one kind of general idea of a company. And so these were kind of the methods I used to creating every single one of my renders. And I think it's, it's very kind of good to be able to understand the flexibility that you get from iterating and designing quickly and being able to, to refine a brand identity until it was how I wanted it to look. And so this is exactly what I did. I 3D rendered a proposal for a sweater, uh, all created in Blender. This kind of uh, this wasn't even kind of existing. It was something that I wanted to uh, bring out into the real world and kind of get that instant feedback of whether people wanted this or not. And so I kind of faked my own photo shoots, faked the own clothing, used the textures to make it look realistic. And then ultimately, the sweater on the right is not a 3D render and was the actual kind of outcome of the sweater that we ended up getting from our manufacturer. And so with all this kind of being just began from a simple concept of what is an idea and how can these be kind of brought to life in visualization. I think this is also a great example of promotional um, kind of material that we were putting on our Instagram to try and promote the jumper. And nothing was ever spent on photography. These aren't photo scans. Everything is built in 3D. Um, and yeah, it, it meant that I didn't have to hire any photographers, any studios, nothing, no cameras. Everything is free or made in Blender. And so, yeah, I think the kind of magnum opus of everything was the fact that this year we were able to then design a booth for London Comic Con and put everything that we had built and marketed over the years that we brought into real life into an actual physical product that people can then buy and build. I think the benefit was that is we didn't have to spend anything on sampling and anything on any of our ideas. It was just the ideas that people liked from those 3D renders we then brought into real life because we understood that there was a demand for them. And so a world had already been envisioned way before it became a reality. And I guess it could be compared to something more like a practical form of manifestation, where if you convey a convincing enough reality, then it can also too become the actual reality. So this, for instance, for instance on the right is a real image, and on the left is entirely made in blend and no kind of image projection used. Um, these are various other projects and ideas that kind of put out on, on my Instagram and various other platforms. And yet, I also started a short film animation to promote all these products and to build a narrative that people kind of wanted to, to enjoy and, and watch from that kind of thing. And so an entire universe was built out of nothing, nothing spent, um, zero pounds, and just working from my bedroom. And I think... In closing, I hope this presentation has kind of shown you the incredible potential that Blender offers in the world of design and marketing. And whether you're creating photorealistic products or building an entire brand from scratch, I think Blender allows you to push, push the boundaries of what's possible. And for me, Blender was that tool that transformed how I approached the way I thought about design. And I think when you render an idea so real that it feels tangible, your mind starts to believe it is possible until eventually that once idea becomes your actual reality. Thank you very much.